Um, we are going to go ahead and get started with our solid waste grant application information session. Um, thank you all for uh, coming and joining us today. I am Cassidy Campbell. I'm a senior planner in the Environment and Development Department of the North Central Texas Council of Government, and I manage the Solid Waste Program. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so I'm going to kick things off here just with a really high-level overview of our Solid Waste Program. Um, this is just to give people a little bit of context. Um, there's definitely more information online, or if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, but NCT COG receives funding from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to administer our soil waste program in our 16 county region. Uh, these funds come from uh, landfill tipping fees um, and they go to TCQ and then those funds are uh, distributed out to the 24 councils of government in uh, Texas. So the main focus of our presentation today are the uh, soil waste grants for local and regional projects. Um, so as funding allows, we typically have um, this call for projects every two years. Um, and this call for projects actually started yesterday. It was initiated yesterday. And we'll talk a little bit more about timeline here in a second. The Resource Conservation Council, also known as the RCC, is our uh, Solid Waste Advisory Committee. They allocate the funding. So the RCC members um, are made up of experts, um, and this includes public and private sector and nonprofit that make up the constituency of our RCC. Um, and so they make the determinations as far as um, how the funding is allocated. What we do is we have um, two budgets, essentially. One is administrative for cost to administer the program, and the other one is implementation, and that um, implementation grant uh, funding bucket is what our solid waste grant come out of. And then also the RCC, they do so much more than just allocate the funding, and they provide their expertise, and they volunteer their hours um, in guiding this program and um, helping talk stuff every step of the way, so we appreciate everything that they do. Okay, so this slide here is uh, really placed in here to be a um, hub of information of resources for everyone. It consists of most of the critical things that you will need as far as applying for solar waste grant. Um, and that, so we have the uh, solar waste grant website where you can access there at the link um, included. And then we also have our grant application guidelines. There's a direct link to that um, that can also be found on our solid waste grant website. But these application guidelines are very, very critical to successful application. So um, I strongly recommend that anybody who is interested in applying for a grant um, review them thoroughly and understand them. And if you have any questions or concerns, contact me or one of the other members um, of our solid waste grant team uh, because we can help you answer those questions. There are certain really critical elements that need to um, have the boxes checked, essentially, um, or your application could be disqualified. Um, and we really don't want that to happen. So, and then also we have a direct link to our call for projects timeline. I'm going to talk about that here in the next slide. And I've also included my contact information, um, my email and phone number. And so you can contact me and we can um, get any questions or concerns ironed out. Okay, so uh, this is a dense slide. I'm not going to read every word off of it. But what you're looking at here is our anticipated call for projects timeline. So it is anticipated, um, it is subject to change, um, but we we are gonna stick as closely to this as we possibly can. And what you can see here, there's two columns. Well, there's three columns, but there's, there's two date-wise. And one is the current timeline, and that's the one that you see in the middle. And then on the right, you see the past timeline. And really the past timeline is just for reference purposes, um, because I realized that some of our uh, in cities and entities and um, grantees that have applied in the past might be feeling a little disoriented at the timing here, and that's because we ended up moving up our call for projects about six months. There were several reasons for that, um, but one of them was to try to provide our grantees more time to execute their projects. Um, and so that this, these two timelines here will show you what we did in the past um, and what we anticipate doing this biennium. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things here before we move on. Call for projects opened yesterday. The call for projects closes at 5 p.m. on May 26, 2021. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that whole process um, later on. But the 5 p.m. is a hard cutoff. Um, our portal will lock you out uh, at that point. Um, we do provide a 30-day grace period for um, people to submit resolutions and court orders. 
And so those can be submitted uh, via email to me. Um, the con contact information you saw on the previous slide, no later than June 26, 2021. Uh, our scoring sessions is where our grant selection subcommittee scores and ranks the grants and decides who uh, will receive funding. The scoring sessions will be virtual this year and they will be held in July. We don't have any established dates yet. We're working on that. And then we will need the RCC and the NCT COG Executive Board to approve our project recommendation. And that is anticipated to happen in August and September of this year. And then as you can see, there's two different um, execution dates for ILAs and, uh, and the local agreements. And then there's two different deadlines for our FY 2022, FY 2023 projects. So the reason for that is that um, since we do work with TCQ on a um, biennial basis, half of our funding goes for the first fiscal year and half of it to the second fiscal year. And so the grants are split as such. So somewhere around half of our grants will execute and perform their projects in FY22 and the other half will be um, in FY23. So that's why you see that difference there. Now, I'm gonna pause for just a second um, in case anybody has any questions on what I've already covered. Um, so I'm gonna just pause here for just a moment. Um, if anybody has any questions, shout them out, raise your hands, um, pop them in the chat. Hi Cassidy, this is Sarah from DFW Airport. And so looking at the those two different fiscal years. Like if you execute your FY22, you have about a year to complete your project. Whereas if, if you're in the FY23, then you only have six months. Is that, Am I understanding this correctly? Yes. Just based on your correct. dates between the agreement yes. and project completion. Yes, okay. sir, you're exactly right. That's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. So. Yes, unfortunately, it, that's kind of the way it boils down. So what we typically try to do for those types of scenarios is um, we do take that into account when we are um, allocating out the grant funding as far as which projects are going to be in which year. And so if, for example, a, a an applicant comes forward and it looks like their timeline is going to need a year for execution, we would put them in that first pot. If it looks like it's something that can be performed and executed in about six to eight months, then we put them in the second pot. We haven't really had any problems um, with that, but we definitely work with people. And there is um, actually a little box on the application where you can select your preferred fiscal year. And so we can't always accommodate everybody, but typically if we do have questions, um, we will reach out to the applicant that had been selected for funding and ask them about timeline feasibility and if you got started at this point could it be done and then um, and another um, item of note is typically speaking one of the longest parts of the process that we've found as far as when these grants are being executed is going through procurement and you can actually go through the procurement process before you sign the ila to an extent like i don't want anybody to call me on the carpet here but you can start generating quotes and you know, making your way through that procurement process so that you're ready to pull the trigger once the ILA is completed. Um, the caveat to that is that you certainly cannot make any purchases or um, enter in any contracts or anything prior to receiving your interlocal agreement. But it's a great question, Sarah. Did that answer your question? It did, thank you. Okay, and then there's also, we do have room for deadline extensions, but we typically, we try to avoid that if possible, but we do also understand that there are extenuating circumstances. Um, for example, the current COVID-19 pandemic, unanticipated things do come up that end up extending timelines unexpectedly. And so we do, um, we have deadlines that we have to meet with TCQ, but we do everything we can to accommodate. Thank you, Sarah, that was a wonderful question. I will move on then. So funding and eligibility, I don't, anticipate, I say I, we don't anticipate any type of scenario like this coming to pass, but there we do need to provide a disclaimer because of the way that we've moved up the timeline for our call for projects. We need to notify everybody that all funding for these projects is subject to sufficient funds in the municipal solid waste disposal account. So what that means is that based on what comes out of the Texas legislature that is currently in session, if we do not receive funding, or we do not receive funding in the amount anticipated, we will not be able, and we are under the obligation to provide funding 
to any projects that may be selected in association with those qualified projects. So that's, you know, as I said, we do not anticipate this being an issue, but it is something that we feel that every potential grantee and applicant would need to know um, as far as what we're looking at here, because we will not know the answer to this question until several months after the call for projects has closed. On that note, based on previous finance, um, the estimated funding that we expect to have available is somewhere between $1.1 to $1.3 million. And when I say estimated funding available, I mean for these local and regional projects. So this is subject to change based on what we received from TCQ regarding funding. And it's also subject to change um, based on final determinations of the RCC as far as how they want to split up the implementation budget and how much will be allocated towards local government grants and how much to regional cognitive projects. But in any case, this is the expected range that we are looking at, um, just to give people a ballpark idea. Um, as far as eligible applicants, cities, counties, school districts are all eligible. Um, universities and other post-secondary educational institutions are not. General and special law districts and councils of governments are eligible. So private sector entities and nonprofit organizations are not eligible for direct funding. However, um, they may receive funding if they are contracting with an eligible entity. So an example of this would be if a city in our region um, applies for a grant to perform a technical study on, uh, let's say, organic waste diversion, they would be able to hire a contractor to perform that study for them, and then the contractor would be paid through the city and we would reimburse the city. So these partnerships can take place uh, we just the private sector and nonprofit entities are not actually eligible eligible to apply directly. So I'm going to pause here um, again just to see if anybody has any questions on this um, section that we've covered. Okay, I'm going to move on then to project types. We have two different project types that fall underneath this umbrella. Um, one is local government and the other is regional collaborative. So the main differences, um, as you can see reflected on the slide here, is the minimum and maximum funding requests for each type of project. But a local government project essentially is one or two eligible applicants, so two cities, two counties, a city and a county, a city and a school district. Um, and then the regional collaborative project is at least three eligible applicants. So you could have two cities and a county, you could have five cities, you could have a school district, a city, a county, you could not do two cities in private sector. Um, so you would have to have at least three eligible applicants to qualify for this. Now I want to talk a little bit um, about the minimum request. If you do not meet the minimum request, your application will be disqualified. Um, that might seem simple, <clears throat> but it's a little more complicated than that. Because I guess to the best way to describe this is to illustrate a brief example. Um, for example, if you were going to apply for a local government project as a standalone city and you submitted a grant application with a request for $20,000, but $6,000 of your line item budget requests were deemed to be ineligible expenses, that would drop you down to $14,000, which would be below the minimum request and result in disqualification. I'm gonna talk briefly in a high level manner about eligible expenses um, and eligible project categories. But if any potential applicant has any questions at all about whether or not any of their line items would be eligible, please reach out to us. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us because we're happy to help you. Sometimes there is gray area and that we can't give just a definitive answer on things because sometimes you have to take into account the entire application, but there are some things that are absolutely not qualifiable. So we're happy to help you look into that. The more time we have to look into it, the better, because sometimes we do need to coordinate with TCEQ uh, because TCEQ is the ultimate authority um, on whether or not something is uh, going to be ultimately approved. So the following project categories are eligible for grant funding. I'm not going to delve into a whole lot of detail here just because of time limitations, but all of this information, including the project categories and examples of what types of things fall under these categories and ideas about what you can fund with these different kinds of project categories are included in our grant application guidelines. 
And again, if anybody is reading through these and has questions or needs clarification, feel free to let us know. Um, we're happy to help you with that. One thing that I did want to point out, though, is that each grant application can only fall under one project category. Otherwise, it counts as two grants. So, for example, if you were intending to purchase a baler for cardboard, um, for recycling cardboard, that would fall under the source reduction and recycling category. And that would be a standalone grant. Um, and you couldn't combine that with, say, a household hazardous waste program, um, like maybe starting a pickup uh, curbside collection. Like those would be two separate categories and would result in two separate grants. And so um, you do need to ensure, too, that what you're applying for um, follows falls squarely within one project category or you'll have to grant, which isn't necessarily a problem, but it, it could end up that way. So I'm going to cover this slide really quickly, and then I'm going to pause um, for questions to you since these are all related to eligibility expenses and categories. So the eligible expense categories that we have um, for certain items is equipment, construction, contractual, and other. Um, equipment is for items that exceed $5,000 or meet or exceed $5,000 in value. Um, construction, um, that, that, an example of that would be um, constructing a concrete slab uh, to put a compactor on, for example. Uh, contractual could be a technical study or entering to a contract with a hauler to do a, an organic waste pilot. Um, and then other. Other is vague, but other is it's not quite a catch-all. A couple of things of note. I guess let me just give you some examples first. So some things that would fall under the other category would be uh, recycling bins. Social media outreach, um, if you wanted to do paid social media outreach. We have a whole range of items that would fit under other. However, some things that do not include what we categorize as supplies that we don't consider an eligible expense. And supplies would include things like um, your generic office supplies, like pens, pencils, paper, um, things of that nature we do not cover. Um, and then also the other category could include equipment type things that cost less than $5,000. So a trailer, for example, um, if you wanted to buy a $1,000 trailer, that would most likely fit under the other category. One thing of note is that each line item must meet or exceed $500 to be considered eligible. So what that would mean is if under the other category, you decide you want to buy nice stainless steel recycling bins to place in libraries and school districts, and each one costs $100, you would need to request at least five of those. Uh, for that line item to be deemed eligible. And again, all of these details, um, well, most of the details um, can be found in the grant application guidelines. So I'm going to pause here for questions. I see that we have one in the chat box that says, with the addition of citizen convenience drop-off locations and an existing transfer station be eligible? Julie, I believe so, um, but I would need to check back with TCQ just to verify that, but I'm relatively confident that that would would qualify uh does anybody else have any questions before uh we move on and julie i'm jotting down that question to remember to follow up with tcq after this call sarah i see your question so that is a little bit of gray area uh the question is would design work count as contractual in my discussions with tcq um oh and if under a design contract that is another question that I would like to pose to TCQ because I think to me that is one of the ones that in the past has been in gray area. I think it's sometimes that is eligible and sometimes it isn't. So it would depend kind of which direction and angle you're going. If you don't mind, I will follow up with you, Sarah, after the call um, and check in with you and see kind of what you had in mind. And then I will run that by TCEQ to give you a more solid answer on that. Um, and I see Julie said, what is the, what the minimum cost of equipment? Typically 5,000. So 5,000 is really where that um, cutoff is as far as what qualifies as equipment. But there are some, well, we, there are certain things like for the most part, we categorize things like that and we track them in our equipment inventory. But there are things that are under the $5,000 cost threshold that we still track like um, cameras and uh, laptop computers and iPads and things like that. So are there any other questions before we move on? Okay, the application process. Applications for this call for project, um, as I mentioned before, need to be received in the web-based application system no later than 5 p.m. on May 26, 2021. 
everything has to be submitted through that portal. Uh, we do not accept applications in any other medium, so no faxes, emails, or hard copies. Um, as I mentioned before, since our web-based application system will lock people out um, at 5 p.m., applicants are encouraged to submit early in the case that they have technical difficulties because then we can um, help you through that before the deadline hits because we do not make any um, exceptions and we do not extend the deadline under any conditions. So um, we don't want anybody to be faced with um, going through the effort of preparing an application and not being able to submit it. So <clears throat> we do encourage you to um, work through the system and try to submit several days early if that's at all possible in just in the event that there's any technical difficulties or even internet connection issues. Um, the link to access the application system uh, can be found here. That is on our grants webpage. And so you can access the application um, at that link. Uh, you will need a username and password. So you'll need to just set up an account. And then the portal has been streamlined. So you shouldn't have to fill in any blanks within the, uh, for those of you who've done this before, within the portal. Everything has been simplified. So what you will do is when you go in there, you will access the application template. You will download it, fill it out and complete it. And then you will re-upload it before you submit. Um, you will also note when you enter the application portal that there are examples of things like the timeline so that you have um, an idea of timelines that have been used in the past. We also have a grant application example can be uh, viewed as well to help you um, through the process, even though the um, application template um, may have changed a bit, it should still be um, a useful guide. Um, I also see that I have a couple of questions in the chat. But as I see your questions, so education cannot be part of another type of project, correct? Yes and no. So it, dep it depends. Um, and I know that I'm really kind of striking out here on answering the questions. But this one, so you can have an education component, or at least in the past, we've had education components as part of a different category. So for example, if you wanted to do a purchase the baler as far as source reduction and recycling for baling cardboard, but then also, also you wanted to do education and outreach in the form of notifying citizens using a either social media or a, a bill insert, you could use those. That should qualify since it is still part of the source production and recycling. It is educational in nature, but it's not a whole separate grant. Does that answer your question, Liz? Or Okay, wonderful. Um, and then I see, Julie, if purchasing mul multiple containers, that would be over 5,000, would that count? Yes. <clears throat> oh, are you asking if purchasing mul would that count as equipment? <clears throat> or would that be grant eligible? It would be grant eligible, certainly. Um, and, and then if you did um, purchase, so depending on the type of, like this is where things get to be a little bit like hazy for me too. My understanding is that typically speaking, it's um, a single line item that costs 5,000. So a forklift that costs 10,000 would be equipment, but buying 50 containers that ended up equaling 5,000 would not, but that we would still be tracking that. So there's some caveats to what I'm saying. And then and there's also room for those kinds of things. Like if when you're filling out the budget, you have questions about it, we can definitely help you with that. And some things do end up getting reallocated and adjusted um, when we're working with TCEQ on the budgets. Um, but for the most part, uh, my understanding is that typically equipment is a single item that costs 5000 or more. Does anybody have any other questions before I jump ahead? OK, so just wanted to highlight a few changes to the application process, just so that people are aware, especially if you have applied in the past, they're just a little heads up for you. Um, In-kind expenses are not eligible for reimbursement. So for context, um, at the end of the biennium, if we do end up having additional funding that we are looking to spend um, in the past, we have reimbursed in kind or matching expenses for um, for some of our grantees. <clears throat> we will no longer um, consider reimbursing for in kind, but we will still certainly consider reimbursement for matching. Um, to illustrate this with an example, these are kind of hard to visualize scenarios. Um, if, for example, one of our grantees purchased a two hundred thousand dollar travel and they put $100,000 towards the cost um, out of city funds, and they requested $100,000 from COG for the remainder, so essentially a 50-50 split. 
if at the end of the biennium we have $100,000 left over, we would consider putting that towards the city's trauma to cover those matching expenditures. Um, we don't always have funds um, left over at the end of the biennium, but if we do, um, that is something that um, is up for consideration for our grantees. Now, another change that has been made is that each entity will be limited to two applications and only one per department. And so we do suggest coordinating um, within your organization. Um, supporting documentation is now required. So we used to strongly recommend items like quotes, photos, maps, drawings, um, and now those are required. Um, we do understand that not every piece of documentation is going to necessarily be relevant to each project, um, but you will need to submit as much information as possible. And we highly recommend submitting as much material um, information as you can. This really helps our scoring subcommittee visualize your projects um, instead of thinking about a what forklift you're going to buy and what it's going to look like. If there's a photo and um, a quote showing how much the cost is estimated to be and maps maybe indicating where, uh, you know, a, um, a boundary of where that forklift will be operating. That's very, very helpful for our um, scoring subcommittee to be able to really visualize the project and it really does hit home. Also, we have begun a new documentation review regarding procurement. I'll talk about that um, briefly here a little bit later in the presentation. Grant score sheets are now included as an appendix to the grant application guideline. This is to make it easier for our applicants to be able to see how the scores are broken down uh, so that you can see how your project will be evaluated. Uh, the project summary slide used to be a required element of the submittal. Uh, that has been eliminated, so it is no longer required. Um, and also the pre-application meeting with NCT COG is no longer required. Anybody would like to meet with NCT COG before submitting your application, we are always available and happy to assist with that. Uh, but it is not required any longer. Now we've talked about some things that are not required. These are the things that are required. So this is kind of just a really brief application checklist that you can run through before you submit. Um, the complete completed application form needs to be submitted. That is what I was referencing that when you enter the grant application portal, you will download that template and fill it out, upload it and submit it. If your project requires private sector notification, you will need to do that. Um, I will talk about that a little bit more in detail here in a few slides. But if you do not do the private sector notification and your project does fall under a category that requires that um, your project will be eliminated, uh, will be disqualified immediately. If you are doing a regional collaborative project, you need to have support letters from all of the participating entities. You also need to sign the certification and assurances documents. Um, those are included in the grant application portal. So um, when you are getting ready to submit, you have to check a box saying or verifying that you have reviewed those documents and those documents are um, available and you can click on them um, and download them um, or just view them in the grant application portal. As I mentioned before, a resolution or court order is required by June 26, 2021. If you have that ready by May 26, then you want to submit that through the portal. You are welcome to do so. Um, if you don't have it quite ready yet and you need to submit it after the portal has locked everybody out, you can email them to me. Just make sure that you get them to me by June 26, 2021. And then also, um, it bears repeating. I know we just covered this, but um, supporting documentation such as maps, drawings, plans, photos, quotes, anything you can think of, well, they're required, but also anything over and above is highly encouraged. Oh, I'm going to stop here. Does anybody have any questions on these last few uh, slides? This is Julie Winchell. <laughs> on the private sector notification, um, would we consult with COG to see whether we needed that or not? Yeah, we can help you. Um, so there are certain project categories that require private sector notification. And so um, if you want to pitch your project to us, we can let you know whether or not we feel that fits in one of those categories and, and help you um, through that process. It's a great question, Julie. So. Um, and I'll talk about that too here in a minute regarding the private sector. So risk assessment requirements, this is something that was new last by and um, we, we do believe it will carry through. There might be some potential changes to our risk assessment process simply because um, our agency is internally reviewing the process that we follow, but I don't anticipate any hugely significant changes. 
but um, a risk assessment is required for each grantee. Uh, currently, it is required for each grantee. I'm going to emphasize the word grantee um, because we do not require this for each applicant. Uh, we only require it if you have actually been selected for funding. So if you do get selected for funding, COG will reach out to each grantee to initiate the risk assessment process if necessary. So the, um, the way that this works is that if an organization or entity already has a risk assessment evaluation um, with any department in our agency um, that took place over the last 12 months, uh, you will not be required to do that again. So some of you may actually already be exempt from this requirement and not have to do anything further. However, if we don't have one on record um, or it has um, in, in a sense lapsed um, that it was greater than 12 months ago, um, we will um, most likely have to initiate this risk assessment process. Typically what this entails is it is, I think it's approximately four page risk assessment questionnaire. We do have that posted on our website um, and we'll double check and make sure everything is up to date. Um, but it's about four pages of questions um, that typically is filled out by um, a financial department or um, an individual that has very uh, thorough knowledge of an entity's um, financial ins and outs. And so that risk assessment questionnaire comes back to us and is reviewed and a certain level of risk is um, attached to that based on um, the questions and the way that they're answered. That is not something I do. Um, that is something that um, experts in another um, department at COG handle. <clears throat> and so they help us um, through that process. Um, and then based on the results of that um, on the level of risk, um, there might be a couple of what they call mitigating controls um, put in. And um, for example, what we did last biennium was anybody who showed a slightly elevated level of risk, because this is very, it's all on a spectrum. We just did an additional progress reporting requirement. Um, so just one extra progress report um, for those entities. Um, so it's hopefully not too onerous. Um, I know it's one more thing to do in the process, but um, but, but just know too that many of you may already be exempt. Um, I'm gonna cover procurement documentation and then I'll pause again for questions because I know this stuff is pretty intense, but we do now do a procurement documentation review. So each grantee um, after you have been funded well, you're required to follow state and federal procurement regulations and guidelines. And so to ensure that those state and federal regulations and guidelines are being followed um, and so that we have documentation on file um, for our auditors prior to purchasing anything that does require the procurement process, which is typically things over $3,000. Um, there's obviously some, you know, again, there's gray areas, many, many aspects of this, but we will need documentation provided by the grantee that our procurement team will review um, and then once they review it a determination will be made um, that either further documentation is required or further steps need to be taken in the process or you will be approved to make your purchase there's several different avenues that can be followed um, it's a little bit too complicated to talk about every scenario in this webinar um, but we will be posting as much information on our website as possible so that people can get an idea of what we're looking for but and the kind of documentation and certifications that we're requesting. That is something that we, on the solid waste management team, we help walk everyone through um, the process uh, because we, we understand that it, it can be confusing and tedious. So I'm gonna pause here for a moment um, to answer any questions that anyone may have. Liz, I see your question. The COG review, it's usually pretty quick. Uh, the question is how long does that process usually take? It ranges. Sometimes it takes a few hours, sometimes it takes a few days, and sometimes it can take up to a couple of weeks. Part of that depends on the workload of our procurement team um, because they have many, many other obligations. Um, and then part of it depends on whether or not the documentation is complete. Sometimes we have had to go back and forth um, as far as um, if um, incomplete documentation was submitted. There can sometimes be delays in the process as far as start to finish and being able to get approved to proceed in and make your purchase. It's usually pretty quick, but also some of the, depending on the route that an entity decides or is required to go, um, the procurement ins and outs can be complicated. 
Okay, private sector notification. Failure to notify private sector service providers will result in immediate disqualification of the application, which is why it's critical to make sure that you are completing private sector notification if your project oh, falls into a certain category. Yeah. The reason for this is that um, these projects are not intended to compete or have an advantage over private industry. So the categories that do require this notification include source production and recycling, citizens collection stations and small registered transfer stations, and a demonstration project under the educational and training projects category. So if you are intending to apply for a grant that you think may, in any stretch of the imagination, fit under these categories, reach out to COG. We can help you. Um, we might definitely need to shoot that up the TCQ for questions or review. Um, but it's typically safer to do private sector notification than not do it and get disqualified. A little more information on that. So what you need to do to provide private sector notification is you will need to contact the entities that are providing services similar to what you intend to do for your grant fund um, that are within that same uh, general geographical area. We do have a list of service providers that you can search um, available on our Time to Recycle website. And so you can you can check that list and cross reference it and you can pull out the private sector entities that you feel you need to contact. Um, and then you need to document that in your grant application. Um, so uh, generally speaking, what we're going to need to see is um, which private sector entities you reached out to, how you reached out to them, whether that was via a phone call, email, and um, whether you submitted a letter of notification. And then also, um, if um, anybody that you spoke with um, in the private sector provided any concerns, to you, um, we'll need to know what those concerns are and also what steps were taken to resolve those concerns that the private sector may have. All applications, as far as the evaluation process, um, are reviewed by our RCC's Grant Selection Subcommittee. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, these scoring sessions will be held in July of 2021. Uh, historically, we have done those um, two full days of scoring. We're tossing around the idea with our um, scoring subcommittee members about doing four half days this year since they will be virtual and there will not be travel involved. So everybody stay tuned to what ends up getting decided on that. Um, but either way, um, applicants will be notified of their presentation date and time um, after the call for projects closes. So you will know, um, COG will reach out to you and let you know um, when you've been slated to present. And so because all applicants are um, required um, to provide a brief presentation to the subcommittee and then also be available to answer any questions um, that they may have about your project. All applications are evaluated based on the following criteria. And as I mentioned before, um, this information is um, lined out in more detail in our grant application guidelines. And you can also reference um, the appendix in there um, that houses the scoring sheet so that you can kind of see the breakdown of where you know how budget and timeline fit together. The new category here is at the bottom. Um, we didn't use to evaluate grants based on past history, uh, but we do now. Um, and so there is a section on um, executing your grant um, that is taken under consideration. Some of the things, for example, um, that we look into is uh, were all funds expended uh, because we need our grantees to um, expend their funds to the extent possible. We're all reports, uh, progress reports and results reports, was everything submitted on time, was it submitted accurately, was it clear and easy to understand. So so just those kinds of things um, as far as meeting deadlines, spending your funds, um, executing the process um, expeditiously. Um, each op applicant must identify a minimum of one of the applicable applicable goals and objectives in um, our regional management plan. So that's our planning for sustainable material management in North Central Texas um, that is linked here so that you can review it. Um, it's to make sure that everything fits in with our regional solid waste management plan um, and what particular aspect of that the applicant's project intends to address. You can find these regional plan goals and objectives. Uh, well, they're in the plan that's linked here in this slide, but you can also find them in Appendix 2 of our Solid Waste Grant Application Guidelines. And in the guidelines, they're broken down so that you can select them out um, as appropriate for your project. I'm going to pause there before I continue on with the evaluation criteria. Just 
to see if anybody has any um, questions. Liz, I see your question for private sector notification. Will we just contact our own waste hauler? If that depends on the project, um, and it depends on who all it's going to impact. It might be limited just to your own waste hauler, but it might be more in depth than that. It would just depend on the projects and the direction that you're taking um, and what other potential private sector um, industry individuals would be impacted by a particular project. I know that probably doesn't help very much, but but without the, yeah, absolutely. Um, you can certainly contact me separately and we can, we can talk through that. Any other questions before I continue on with the valuation criteria? Okay, so these are just some notes that we would like applicants to consider um, and include in their grant application, just to show that these items have been considered and are not going to pose a problem in the future because one of the important elements of the solid waste program um, grants is, I guess you could say longevity. Our scoring subcommittee likes to see projects that are not just a quick one and done and over in a two year period, but that um, could extend out into the future. And so I'm um, considering things like ongoing maintenance costs for grant funded equipment. Is that going to be affordable? Is that going to be really tedious um, as far as having the equipment uh, down for the count um, frequently? So considering the cost, considering the inconvenience um, and whether or not it's feasible going forward is something that um, all applicants will need to look into. Also, uh, will your equipment be sitting idle? Um, have you considered um, whether or not you'll be able to use it unless you have another component? Example that we provide here is if you're applying for a trailer, do you need a tractor to pull your trailer? And if you do, but you don't have a tractor, is your trailer going to even be functional or usable because it's just going to be sitting somewhere and not be used? So, what we would just recommend is apply for a trailer and a tractor. Um, no, I'm kidding, but um, to just evaluate what you would need um, to be able to utilize your equipment effectively um, or at all, really. And then also on that same note, um, just considering just would your equipment have to sit idle because you wouldn't be able to get your staff trained or licensed to be able to use it. So. Um, just taking into consideration those different types of um, potential red tape um, that can trip things up once you have been funded. Um, applicants are um, able to appeal funding recommendations to the RCC, but these appeals have to be based on specific identified er error um, and not on factors that allow discretion. Uh, the deadline to appeal is 5 o'clock p.m. August 30th, 2021, um, and these appeals must be submitted in writing. Um, email does qualify as writing, so it can either be submitted via email or a letter. If a solid waste grant um, applicant does get um, selected for funding, um, you will be required to enter into a standard interlocal agreement with COB. Um, this agreement lines out deadlines and um, budgets and expectations for performance um, on both ends. Um, so it's essentially a contract between the two parties. Um, we also want everybody to be aware that project funding is only provided on a reimbursement basis. So the applicant or the grantee, rather, um, will be fronting all of the funding. They'll be paying for everything. And then they submit the documentation, including the proof of payment, to COG, um, and we reimburse um, at that point. We are able to turn around these reimbursement requests very quickly. Um, typically, if we receive a complete reimbursement request packet, that doesn't um, require further uh, information. Uh, we're able to get a check cut and um, sent and mailed to you within two weeks. Sometimes um, we do require more information um, that can extend that process, but generally speaking, um, we turn these around very quickly. We also, subrecipients um, need to understand that um, COG or TPQ will um, need to be allowed to perform on-site visits for uh, monitoring the progress of the projects and um, verifying equipment delivery and things of that nature. And you also must agree to provide reports uh, related to the results of the project to come. Uh, as I mentioned before, reimbursement basis only. Uh, the way that we reimburse is we receive a reimbursement request from the grantee. This packet is uh, required to include these uh, four items. The signed reimbursement request form, we do provide a template uh, the signature does have to be official, so the signature will either need to be um, hand-signed and then scanned to us, or it will need to be an official PDF signature 
typing in um, a signature um, unfortunately does not uh, qualify as an official signature. We will also need to see a purchase order, an invoice, and proof of payment. Uh, typically, proof of payment is a clear check, but if um, an entity has paid via credit card, we would need to see the credit card receipt and then uh, a bank statement um, showing that that credit card bill was paid. Does anybody have any questions on any of this before um, I move on? Reporting requirements. Um, all of our grant recipients do have to submit reports to us um, indicating their progress um, towards completion um, on a quarterly basis um, until final reimbursement has been issued. And then a results report uh, reflecting the cumulative results from the start of the project to August 31st, 2023 is also required. And then we have a year later results report. Grant recipients have to submit to us documenting the results one year after the project completion date. So NCTCOG does provide templates um, for all of these reporting documents. And now I will open it up for questions. I apologize because I was planning to leave more time at the end for questions, um, but I am happy to hang around as long as um, we have questions. And so I know some of you may have to jump off for um, other meetings. Um, so I apologize for only leaving three minutes here, um, but please. Um, go ahead and shout out your questions, uh, raise your hands, um, pop them in the chat box, uh, and I will answer your questions. I'm also going to flip to the next slide so that you can see my contact information. Um, and then also Hannah Allen and Elena Berg, they are also members of our solid waste management team, and you can contact them as well. And also, as you all know, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, if you have any questions um, that either come up afterwards um, or if you have any um, questions that um, are specific, we are absolutely happy to help. Um, that is what we're here for. And uh, we're very excited about this earlier call for projects and we're excited to see our application. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today and for participating and for the excellent questions. Um, let us know if you have anything else that comes up. As mentioned, I don't want to keep being a dead horse here, but we're happy to help. Um, in any way that we can over here at COG. And so thank you again for being here with us today.